So uh, yeah, my name is Lorenzo Spada. Uh, thank you, Adam, for having me here. This is great uh, first experience for myself. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, well, a presentation is called From Lines to AI Minds. Uh, I'm going to take you through a journey, actually. It's starting way back in the 1970s, uh, all up until modern day, uh, regarding the barcode, essentially the birth of the barcode and uh, how we're applying some uh, AI techniques um, using Vision AI to help um, with our global standards model and with the uh, global supply chain um, uh, you know, system. So I'll walk through uh, my slides here. Uh, so I'm an MIT alumni. Uh, my background is in computer science, cryptography, AI, and quantum physics. Um, I work for, of course, uh, GS1 Canada. It's a neutral, not-for-profit, uh, industry-driven standards organization. It's a mouthful. Uh, we are essentially at the epicenter of the supply chain. Uh, so yes, we um, sort of gave birth to barcodes back in 1973 uh, through a different association uh, back then. Uh, we're now called the GS1 Global Standards, and we're actually a part of 116 member organizations around the world. So Canada is just one of 116. Uh, we are actually the third largest, I believe, uh, member organization. Uh, and what this really means is we provide that sort of um, trade level uh, readiness for supply chain communities, whether you're on the manufacturing side or whether you're on the retailer side. Um, being a part of global standards essentially ensures trade readiness and authenticity and a bunch of other things uh, that go with the barcode. A lot of people think barcode is just, you know, the symbol. Um, and it is in many cases, uh, but there's a lot of information that are, is uh, typically behind that symbology uh, and what it sort of represents. Uh, we are uh, winners of uh, last year and this year. In fact, tomorrow we'll be accepting the award of IDC CIO Innovations um, for some of the particular AI work that we've been working on in the uh, pharma space, um, pharmaceutical space. So just some interesting facts about global standards. Um, over 10 billion barcodes are actually scanned every day. So if you think about that number, it's pretty crazy. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, states that you know medicinal errors are up uh, significantly. Um, there's, I think, about 10,000 deaths reported every year, um, over 10,000 deaths uh, based on medicinal distribution errors. So you can imagine you know, having um, healthcare institutions leverage uh, supply chain standards whether it be a, an identifier on a, on a you know a piece of medication a you know prescribed medication or a dispensary system uh, can help you know definitely help save lives even at the patient level and then the adoption of gs1 standards globally has resulted in about 150 billion dollars in industry savings it's pretty huge uh, given the complexity of all of our supply chains you have to think about all the countries involved um, you know and the different governance that's around them uh, from each of these nations uh, and, and the requirements so it's a pretty large number and you know being a part of the standards the gs1 standards community um, apply you know helps with those savings or those cost savings for various reasons and i'll i'll indicate why those are uh, so we'll uh, we talked about the timeline so you know way back in the 70s this is actually a, a very nostalgic view or, or image uh, 1974 of the first barcode scan ever. Uh, it was actually a, a pack of Wrigley's gum, believe it or not. Uh, and it was at a Marsh supermarket in Ohio, Troy, Ohio. Uh, and you see the lady there in a newspaper uh, paper clipping. She she scanned the first one. Uh, it was a milestone in our in our human history, to be honest with you, because it was our first uh, the first time that we could productize um, and identify products rather um you know through a supply chain system and uh, create markers for them in a symbology and we needed technology for this as well this used to be called the upc a code the very first one uh we needed technology like an ibm ncr system for example that would scan those one-dimensional barcodes uh so here's just a basic timeline uh you know barcode evolution Starting back in the 1970s, as I mentioned, 1973 was actually the the, the time that was uh, the um, one-dimensional UPCA code was was uh, designed and created. Uh, it was a gentleman named Woodland, Norman Woodland, uh, partnering with IBM at the time, had created um, this particular encoded symbology uh, to use for the supply chain industry for the world. Uh, and we are actually celebrating 50 years later, uh, 2023, the the 50th anniversary. And uh, there's actually a movement away from one dimensional barcodes i won't go into that detail tonight but um into something called the sunrise 2027 event i believe in a few years they're looking to move industry 
completely away from one dimensional barcodes and into QR codes fully or two dimensional codes uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of them being that they house a lot more data for us to, um, to store and identify um, for, you know, throughout the supply chain process. Uh, then in the 1980s, just uh, going back to the timeline here, um, you know, the originally the, the institution or the council was called the um, formerly known as the U Uniform Code Council, UCC. Uh, it then reestablished its name to Global Standards, uh, and this occurred in the uh, earlier mid '80s. Um, and then, you know, towards the end of the 1980s, uh, we started to see a lot more adoption in Global Standards in the use of barcodes, symbologies. Um, the late '80s, you really started to see. I think it's over 8,000 stores. It states there per year, or institutions rather per year, were um, you know, upgrading their technologies, their their entire system, inventory management systems. I don't know if you any of you recall, but you know, stores had to shut down their warehouses and and their floor space just to do inventory counts. You know, they were doing them on paper. <laughs> um, so we've come a long way, of course. And uh, you know, the supply chain standards have really started to take shape by the late '80s. And then the '90s, we we went into uh, an era of you know requiring further data. Uh, so 2D codes were actually introduced. They were introduced um, initially in Japan, believe it or not, to assist and support the automotive industry. Uh, Toyota was one of the big advocates of 2D codes. In fact, they were one of the first ones to adopt, uh, to design and adopt the 2D codes, um, you know, for various reasons. And one of the main reasons, to be honest, was the fact that it required the least amount of real estate, I believe one centimeter by one centimeter on any given product or item. Uh, which would collect, uh, you know, an encoded message off of a scan, an optical scan. So uh, this type of code, two-dimensional code, was able to capture over 4,000 alphanumeric characters, as opposed to about 20-some-odd characters from a one-dimensional code. Uh, so it was a big, big difference. Today, of course, we know QR codes are everywhere, mass adoption. Uh, we use them for various reasons, including marketing um, as well. But they are the most versatile code, and this is the reason why the industry is trying to push, um, you know, QR codes further into the uh, into the supply chain um, process uh, and kind of give it that bump in, into industry uh, to get us to that that point where they adopt, you know, uh, manufacturers and retailers of the world have to adopt the um, sort of the new standard. Um, you know, 2D codes have become ubiquitous and, and they can facilitate, we talked about, you know, marketing campaigns or, or mobile interactions. You know, you can go to a Tim Hortons today and just scan a QR code to get, you know, into a rewards program or something like that. It's, it's used everywhere. Uh, 2D codes are utilized for product identification, primarily in our ecosystem, in the supply chain world and authentication uh, and consumer engagement in some cases, direct to consumer engagement. Uh, but really where, um, you know, most of our uh, sort of business lies as a not-for-profit is in the attribution, um, you know, layer. We, we have over 6,000 attributes uh, that we deal across about nine sectors, including healthcare, uh, grocery, general merchandise, pharmaceutical. Uh, so we're, we, we have roundtables and we sit at about nine uh, different boards. Uh, so you can imagine the complexity in our data model. <laughs> alone uh, just from trying to organize uh, all of this attribution among different industries simply within Canada, but we also have to adhere to the global standard model as well. So there's that to consider, ensuring that the items are trade ready globally. So, uh, you know, if you think about a can of Coke, a can of Coke will be a can of Coke. It doesn't matter if it's in Canada or in the US or in Germany, right? Um, the numbers will be different based on serialization and, and identification, but the product itself um, is is the same uh, regardless. Uh, you know, it just may differ based on uh, you know what industries um, are are trying to promote. If you've got a new product coming in uh, that's a new Coke can, for example, and there's some criteria around um, you know what distinguishes a new product. So if uh, you know a new flavor of Coke comes out, it would require a new identification, and there's criteria behind uh, what that looks like. Just to give everyone some perspective. Uh, so what is our commitment at the end of all of this? Well, you know, our standards is, is something that uh, we want our industry leaders that are a part of these boards, you know, facilitate adoptions or help us facilitate adoptions. But we provide programs to help with that adoption. Uh, we provide education and training and regulatory compliance with government agencies. So that's our, our commitment with our standards uh, for the community. Uh, hence the reason we're a not-for-profit as well. 
Uh, we have go uh, board collaborations, so we work uh, very closely with our, our board members who represent all of those different industries I mentioned earlier, um, whether it's pharmaceuticals, healthcare, uh, grocery, food services, uh, those types of industries. And then uh, data excellence, which is really at our core. Um, you know, data excellence uh, strategies really define, in my opinion, uh, the, the quality of service or uh, quality of a product in an organization because, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as they say. So we have a tiered system uh, that allows for crowdsourced data, which is pretty much free and open. Uh, we also have certified data all the way to the other end, tier one, which is brand owner certification. There are other certifications throughout the process, of course, level two, level three. Level two is verified by third parties. Uh, so these could be, uh, these could be certification, um, you know, regulatory bodies, uh, you know, people that, uh, you know, organizations that, um, you know, certify halal meat, for example, or kosher products, those types of things. Uh, then we have industry protocols. So there are government mandates uh, from the healthcare side, especially, or pharmaceuticals and such that require specific protocols to be met, and they would be considered level three at a minimum. Uh, and then level four is just authenticated by um, GS1 trading partners, though those who um, are part of the GS1 trading um, supply chain ecosystem and have authenticated their data uh, that it is accurate based on, um, uh, you know, um, a certification gate step for them. Uh, so the importance of standards, uh, you know, barcodes have uh, had a massive impact, obviously, on logistics, inventory management, product traceability. Um, you know, it's it's huge across the industry for for the most part. Uh, real time data today is extremely important, uh, which is the reason why two-dimensional codes have such um, an appetite across the supply chain industry. Uh, the more data that we can harvest uh, and, and you know, provide insights on, for example, the better. Uh, it gives us better visibility. It gives the manufacturers uh, you know, more lead time and visibility and reduces potentially a lot of their costs. Uh, and the retailers as well, um, you know, being able to source the content they need um, GS1 standards ensure product authenticity and preventing counterfeit goods. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty important feature actually uh, within the GS1 ecosystem. So becoming a trading partner with GS1 Canada, um, this is sort of one of the benefits of being part of that, you know, authenticated chain, if you will. Uh, and in the near future, we're also integrating um, ourselves with, you know, W3C based standards on verifiable credentials. So being able to verify in an automated fashion that, you know, some of those, um, you know, certified uh, organizations that certify for kosher products, for example, they could do this uh, through integration methods systematically without having to actually, you know, verify themselves uh, each time. This is, can be done uh, through a programmatic uh, method. So these are some of the things that we're, we're working on, um, just to give you a big picture as to where we sit uh, in the supply chain world. Um, yes. So uh, we are uh, now I'll jump to, you know, the AI advancements. OK, so uh, what does this all mean? How does it really play into uh, vision AI, as I described earlier? Um, we have several business units at the organization that cover um, different services. Uh, their services are matched up against these industries I meant, you know, mentioned earlier. We call them industry managed services or solutions, rather, IMSs. Um, and one particular uh, business unit is called the content capture uh, unit. And we have a physical facility in Montreal, a very large establishment that uh, takes in product from all kinds of manufacturers. Um, it, we're, we're talking, you know, the think about the L'Oreal's of the world for, you know, um, uh, you know, beauty products and so forth, everything to nail polish, uh, you name it. Uh, we even store products that are in um, that require refrigeration or you know temperature controlled systems. So it's a large um, operation. Uh, I'm going to play a video for you for a few minutes just to kind of give you an idea of um, you know the establishment and what we do there. Um, and this will you know sort of provide a good segue into the AI tools that we've leveraged to help this operation out um, from start to finish. So without further ado, I'll just play this video if I can. Good business requires great content. Your business success relies on your ability to provide customers with a great product experience and trading partners with the professional quality, reliable image data and content they need when they need it. GS1 Canada's content capture services can help. 
by providing the 100% accurate and complete global standard product images and data your trading partners require for online marketplaces, retail planogram, food service catalogs, advertising flyers, marketing collateral, medication dispensing, and more. Our commitment to data excellence ensures your product content can be easily uploaded, updated, and efficiently shared with your trading partners from one place, ensuring accurate and consistent brand representation for products across the grocery, food service, healthcare, pharmacy, and general merchandise and hardline sectors. At our Montreal studio, every product goes through a finely tuned content capture process, developed and refined through 25 years of industry collaboration and global best practice expertise. When a product arrives, it is inspected for damage and storage requirements. When I receive the package, I make sure there's no physical damage. Products are then weighed and measured using a consistent, standardized methodology across all brands and product categories. This standardized data is essential for accurate planogramming and e-commerce shipping estimates. We take the product, we weigh it, and then we measure it. We give it a global uh, standard product code. And then we also identify the item, if it's plastic or cardboard. The retailers are relying on us to do accurate measures to put their products on the shelves. Once normalized on pack data is captured, products are cleaned and prepped to perfection behind the scenes, ready for professional image capture. Our expert photographers ensure optimized lighting and that the required angles and views are captured according to GS1 Global Standard Image Guidelines. Once captured, images are sent to an editing specialist. We ensure that the images are perfect. We retouch if needed. We ensure that everything is legible and we provide high quality images. The goal is to reproduce the in-store experience, but without having the product in your hands. Touch-ups can include color correction, glare removal, enhanced legibility, and creation of closed cut clipping paths for consistent results. While we work on cosmetics, we need to make sure that the colors are perfectly representative of the product we have in hand. Final quality assurance testing ensures content is ready to be uploaded and shared with trading partners. Whether you are selling packaged goods, health and beauty products, food service, pharmaceutical, or any number of other products and categories in store or online, GS1 Canada's diverse content capture services provide flexible options to meet trading partner demands for a single source of standardized, reliable images and data. Ensure your trusted content is easily accessible to the distribution channels you count on to successfully bring products to consumers with GS1 Canada's content capture services. All right. Uh, so now that you, you know, have a, uh, had a chance to look at the content capture uh, operation, um, we looked at, you know, what type of AI could be leveraged to help enhance some of the services that we already offer. So we have a photography studio in Montreal, as you saw, you know, in the video. Um, there are, you know, plenty of reasons why, um, you know, Vision AI came to mind with the group, uh, the organization early on about a year and a half ago. Uh, the AI portfolio has sort of grown over the last two years uh, within the organization, particularly in vision AI and in the optical character recognition, of course. So we use object detection for validations and logo branding detection. So if you think about dairy farmer logos, biologic or organic logos, um, halal meat you mentioned or kosher products. So all of the validations on those uh, registries and, and the allergen information, for example, can be detected through our object detection models. Uh, that we've trained. Some of them are, it actually goes through a tiered system uh, without going into the specifics here on the call, um, but we use a YOLO framework um, among others and it provides the best sort of, uh, you know, data um, uh, representation for us um, in terms of accuracy and also speed, um, speed to delivery. Uh, but we use the, a tiered system because for improved accuracy and, and training models, we, we didn't want it to only pass through a single integration layer. So uh, we wanted to enhance uh, yeah, the capabilities across the product. There's a lot of things to consider with products because you have uh, light ambiguity, you have round shaped objects. They're not always perfect, you know, squares and so forth. So, um, you know, enhancing uh, an object detection model based on uh, some of those, uh, you know, challenges was, uh, was difficult at the time, but we sort of mustered through it. 
Um, sustainability is another one, uh, you know, enhancing recycling and ESG processes so we can leverage object, object detection for that. Uh, the big one is nutrition fact tables. So on all food products, um, you'll notice obviously these days that nutrition fact tables are everywhere. Uh, in fact, they are a mandate from the Canadian government uh, to be on all products. Now, the challenge here is these are all new products. We're not talking about products that are on the shelves already in, at Walmart or something. Uh, these would all be net new products that haven't seen the marketplace yet. Uh, we ensure that the uh, content is accurate. The attribution is scraped essentially from these nutrition fact tables as an example and stored into the global data model, the GDM on our side to validate that this information is accurate based on the what was stored in our registries uh, and that the uh, that all the um, components are, are, are there, obviously. Uh, and more importantly, to... Um, you know, quickly grab the attribution I mentioned earlier and stick it into the um, into the data model that could be leveraged globally at that point. So all this happens in a matter of seconds, of course, uh, within the studio once the uh, the object detection models pick it up. Um, you know, some other uh, ideas around you know where our AI for or roadmap is going. Uh, we have AI driven analytics that we're looking to use to optimize uh, inventory forecasting in the future, perhaps, or demand planning uh, for you know, the retailers of the world, um, you know, AI powered predictive maintenance, reducing downtime and manufacturing costs or distribution. Uh, some of the other areas are, you know, pattern identifiers. So wouldn't it be great if, you know, uh, organizations part of the GS1 supply chain, as an example, uh, would have, uh, you know, a robust system in place that allows us to track whether essential um, items, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, from say bottled water, you know, we have a disaster that happens in the East Coast, a hurricane or something. It would be amazing if we were to be able to detect some of these occurrences and have, you know, reverse logistics or areas where we can improve logistics to help push those essential items like water, bottled water and so forth to those areas in need uh, very quickly. So these are just some of the, the ideas around where pattern identifiers could help us um, in that area. Uh, we work very closely with Health Canada, of course, in the uh, with an integration and notifications for reverse logistics and product recall specifically. Uh, we're also looking to help, um, uh, you know, in the automation space as well for the supply chain, uh, looking to alleviate some constraints uh, logistically as well. So that's just sort of our, our AI roadmap, if you will. Uh, further to our AI roadmap, most of the models that we've discussed uh, or that we, you know, I presented earlier, will be um, integrated in the near future into a mobile app. I can't go into the specifics just yet, but uh, it will be leveraged by the trading partners. It's not a consumer-based product per se, uh, but it could be used to leverage uh, the same thing, the object detection, having it, uh, you know, uh, being uh, able to use the mobile application to scrape that information and pull the global data, uh, you know, model integration basically directly on site, you know, at, at a manufacturer's warehouse without having to send products to our warehouse. Uh, so there's plenty of use cases around that. Um, you know, this would help obviously brokers and trading partners and everyone tremendously. You wouldn't have to, um, you know, uh, spend a lot of time shipping products around. Uh, we do, we've done a lot of this in collaboration with some of our partners through an R&D innovation lab. Uh, this is something we spun up about a year ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, and we work collaboratively with our, our trading partners, some of the uh, industry leaders as well on uh, what we call challenge scenarios. This is a very new area for us, um, but it would be great to work in a space where we leverage innovation labs together. Uh, we build solutions together as we are a not-for-profit. We are also a non-compete, uh, meaning any solution we develop has to be industry agnostic and cannot provide any sort of competitive edge from one trading partner to another. So it has to be, um, you know, sort of uh, balanced uh, and uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, then we have a product description generator and an SEO key term generator that we're introducing to the market as well. Um, these generators are uh, strictly back end API, uh, you know, uh, capabilities. Uh, they don't necessarily have a UI at the moment anyway, but they are used to, you know, once we, we intake some of the products and, you know, some organizations ingest them by the thousands or the hundreds of new products coming in, uh, we can quickly, uh, you know, provide them with product description generators. So we, you know, we know what the product looks like. We have a description. We can even identify its weight or sorry, not its weight, it's its dimensions, believe it or not, uh, with high probability. 
but it would be great to have a you know sometimes just difficult to come up with lifestyle descriptions or product descriptions and having a generator um you know would would help tremendously for the community uh, as well as an seo key term generator the same same concept really uh, and I believe that's it. That's the end of my presentation. I have a QR code here on the screen that will uh, send you guys over to a form. Uh, don't worry, we're not collecting uh, data and selling it to third parties. This is just a feedback form for the presentation. Um, and uh, if you've had any, you know, any additional information or you have any questions, you can drop a line there as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to know if anyone would be wanting to become a trading partner. There will be a link that describes um that as well in there a radio button uh so yeah please uh have a look and uh and i appreciate the feedback